We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. Tonight's question comes from Tito B.A., who wrote, Mo, I'm looking for a board game with lots of miniatures, preferably fantasy themed. I came across Quest for the Dragon Lords, but I got mixed reviews about it. Do you have any other suggestions? Oh, hey, Tito. Thanks for reaching out and for the rather specific question. Now, I had this one in our question list uh, flagged or bookmarked to talk about on an AMA because I could probably pretty quickly drop five or ten so games with lots of minis and we'll be done with it. There you go. Answer your question, Tito. Have fun. But when reading this question the other day, uh, combined with actually something that came up in our, our Tabletop Bellhop Discord, um, when thinking about these, and I, I came up with the idea that, you know what, this would be a cool chance for Sean and I to talk about how we feel about miniatures in board games. Now I'm talking about minis in games. And I thought it'd be interesting. It's not something we really ever discussed before. And to be honest, I have no idea what Sean's opinion is on this. Maybe he prefers cubes. Maybe he prefers fully painted, but pay someone else to paint them. I don't actually know. And we're talking about board games with miniatures and not miniature games, right? Yeah, that's that's what I wanted to do. Is I, I want to miniature games to me is a totally own thing. Um, unfortunately, my camera is just not quite wide enough to show my shelves of shame, um, filled with unpainted miniatures over there. I'm, I'm not talking about the miniature painting hobby. That that is its own thing. It's it's not just games. It's buying armies and collecting armies and modifying miniatures and WYSIWYG and and basing and all the extra stuff. That is something completely different that actually both of us have taken part in over the years uh, to various extents. Um, I'm the one that keeps diving back in and then backing off. I actually love miniature games and I'm super impressed by the number of impressive looking ones out there. Like if I had the spare time, I'd totally be playing Infinity, especially after seeing that scenery that was at Origins. Oh my God, that looks so good. And all you got to do is woodcut. You just put it together. And War Machine always looked pretty cool to me. And and Gaslands, man, I Sean and I would both be playing Gaslands. I'm pretty sure every weekend if we had the time to do it. Um, and well, then there's the space. But that's not what we're talking about tonight. So games that include miniatures, but don't really need to. Instead of minis, right. you could have cubes or meeples or chits, counters, standees, whatever. So while these games have miniatures, the game isn't about the miniatures. They're mm. just playing pieces that could be represented in another way. Yeah, exactly. And then the reason I thought this would be worth talking about is because it seems like it's a pretty divisive topic. Uh, it seems like there are people on both sides of the fence, as well as some people sitting in the middle. And I see a lot of people, especially in the last year or so, bemoaning the rise of the miniature board game crowdfunding project, the 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 huge the the main allure of the game is either the number of miniatures you get, how big they are, how scantily clad they are, how creepy they are, and, and very little information about the game. And one company, of course, comes up a lot during those conversations, and that is Simon, um, which was once known as Cool Mini or Not, and actually started as a website to rate miniatures one to 10. Um, they are, are probably known for starting this whole trend of games with over the top production values and ridiculous amount of miniatures where say the base game comes with 10, 20, maybe even 30, but then there's all these stretch goals and additional boxes. And by the time you're done, you've got 500 minis coming in a stack that's eight boxes tall when it shows up at your house. And some people feel this flash, the flash of the minis, the draw of the over the top production is actually taking away from the game side of things. And honestly, I can see their point in some cases. So I think while it would make for a much more interest, interesting discussion, unfortunately, I tend to agree with you here and for various reasons. But for the sake of the show, I'm actually going to try and put myself into the shoes of some of our miniature painting fans out there. A role I discovered early on I was not suited for because, well, I can't pay, paint a mini to save my life. But that right. doesn't mean they don't have a point. Uh, right. You know, there's, there's, there are a lot of artists out there who are gamers uh, and who do love uh, spending time in front of a game or at a you know, workbench with a paintbrush in their hand. Uh, and, and, you know, cool mini or not comes from minis. They, you know, they, Simon is cool mini or not, the, play, the number one place to show off your painting skills. So why wouldn't their games have massive quantities of, of great minis to paint. Yeah, you know, I totally agree. Simon making them 
makes perfect sense. But it's kind of the fact that it seemed like for a while there, and I, I would even say even now, that the only Kickstarters you hear any hype about anymore, at least on the board game side of things, RPGs are doing their own things, are these ones with these over-the-top production value, which tends to be tons and tons of miniatures. Uh, and again, either scale, size, or the look of them, that's the main draw of them. Um, we used to do a show on weekends called the, um, uh, uh, now I already forget, what do we call it, coffee break? Uh, the brunch. coffee break, We can sun, Sunday brunch, that's it, sorry, Sunday brunch. Where we'd look at Kickstarters and like almost every week it was either card games with black text on white background and white background with black text that based on some offensive premise or games with tons of minis. And it's like, man, they are they're just like everywhere. It seems like the big thing that's out there. Well, and I think, though, it's it depends because, again, you've got. Yes, there are games like, you know, and pretty much anything from Simon. I think we can agree that that's what they do and that's what they're good for. Uh, there were yep. a couple of big uh, mythological Greek-based mm -hmm. games that I think were really well suited to that sort of things. But then you get other big games like uh, Masters of the Universe, for instance, yep. which, yes, they have minis, but I wouldn't exactly call them a mini game the same way, you know, the Marvel games were, you know, you, you didn't Marvel you didn't United. get a, a stack of, of six feet high of boxes of minis once you went through the Kickstarter, you got some minis, which were cool representations of the characters in the game and, you know, some nice scenery or, or you know, yeah. uh, castles, which I think are very reasonable, uh, ex you know, accessories to the game. Again, they're, they're ways to highlight the game and don't necessarily take away from it. Uh, and they aren't, you know, from a, a miniature company that is, you know, let's be fair, there to promote miniatures and, and yeah. the painting lifestyle. Now, the interesting one, though, with Mass of the Universe, that one doesn't bug me at all, but it's based on action figures. It's based on having those three-dimensional characters in your hands, and I don't think I'd want a Master of the Universe game, especially not with cubes, maybe with meeples or standees, but, like, I want a big, chunky He-Man that I can play with and, you know, fight Skeletor with. Like, so in that case, I think it fits perfectly. But why does Castles of Burgundy need miniature castles and miniature fields with little cows in it? Well, I mean, as as someone who does public plays events, that's why you need those games. Again, table, getting things to the table, yeah. getting people interested in them and drawing eyes to the game, whether, you know, I, again, if you own the game, may, you know, you might not need to draw any eyes to the game, but if you're out there in the world playing games, if you're trying to get attention to the game, the difference, as we saw at Origins, between our version of castle panic and the deluxe version oh, yeah. of castle panic is yep. night and day yeah, i mean that's they're a good just, example they're just fantastic the game just pops you can't not go over and look at castle panic deluxe when you get the exact same game in cardboard for you know 200 dollars less or right. more i think <laughs> Which that actually leads me to a really good point. What Fireside did, though, is they relaunched Castle Panic. They put out a second edition. They fixed up some of the artwork. They added more representation. They um, uh, streamlined some of the rule books. And then they put out this really nice big box. Uh, for our opinion on the big box, check out last episode where we reviewed it. But then after that, they then did a Kickstarter for this deluxe edition. And what they're doing there that I think is fascinating and, and I love is the fact that they're offering both. That if you have the disposable income, you can get the luxury version of the game. You can get the deluxified. You can get the super shiny, oh my gosh, it looks amazing version. But then you could still just get basic Castle Panic at Target still. I don't know the retail, but it's fairly cheap. And then for, for that game in particular, there's all in between, right? Then you have the deluxe big box and you can buy the expansion separate. But you can play with just the counters, just the cardboard chits, and it's fine. Or you can get the deluxe miniature version. I think one of the problems you get into with that is the number of SKUs that companies are willing or yeah. able to produce and stock. Uh, Fireside? great for them has the ability to store three SKUs for the same game plus all of the different SKUs for the miniature the packs the expansions and and all that other stuff but you know for a lot of companies that is a lot of resource management yeah. for one game i mean it, yeah. it's all those SKUs for just one game 
And really, uh, it's four for the base game because they have the base game, the base game deluxe, the big box, and the big box deluxe. So I was I was forgetting that it was actually there was a deluxe and a big box deluxe separately. Yes. Than, um, yeah. No. Absolutely. And I think one of the other things you run into that if you know, I think Fireside did it right. So Fireside had different uh, different sort of kickstarters, but I think there's a lot of companies out there who are doing one Kickstarter. And then after the Kickstarter, they're splitting off and doing a, here's the luxury and here's the, and here's the basic. But mm -hmm. in, when you're doing that, a lot of times, I think the people who are, are buying the basic are paying a little extra because there is a luxury version out there, right? The costs right. are going to get a little bit spread out. Yeah. You're going to pay more Sometimes for the deluxe not a one, <laughs> but not, but you're not going to necessarily pay the full price because they were able to, to offload a little bit of that production cost onto the production of the base game as well. So another example of that, that, that I thought was, was great was Dune Imperium. So Dune Imperium put out a version, I technically like three different versions, but it really, it was because of the Kickstarter. So there's the version with cubes. And then there was a version with minis, but the retail version was the one with cubes. So if you back the Kickstarter, you had the choice. You could get the deluxe components, which to me is exactly what crowdfunding is for. That's what stretch goals should be. That's what add-on should be. Whereas everyone else in the world, if they chose not to help invest in the game and get it produced, has the version with the cubes or then has to buy it on the secondary market. And to me, that felt like the perfect way to do it. The, the, that way the miniatures are there for the people who want it. And generally the people who want those deluxe components are the people who are the early adopters and who are going to dive in on something like a crowdfunding project, as opposed to going to their local game store, Target, Walmart, or online to just buy the game eventually after hearing a couple reviews on. And I, I think generally that's fair. Um, there is unfortunately the FOMO. Uh, and, and there's also the fact that, you know, some people just don't go on Kickstarter. Uh, they yeah. may not understand it. They may not know about it. Uh, you know, you could be the biggest Dune fan in the world, but not know about Kickstarter. And so the right. fact that there was this perfect game for you with the, you know, the iconic version of Baron Harkonnen that just looked perfect mm -hmm. and you would have spent years painting it and you didn't even know it happened and it came and gone and now you can't buy it unless you pay somebody's, you know, ridiculous like eBay, yeah. eBay markup. Um, well, there are companies out there now, like the game steward, like it's a lot easier to get a Kickstarter you missed now than it ever was before. So it's, it's generally, you can still get them, but yeah, you're going to pay even more then. Okay. Now, another example is the opposite way around. You have a game that came with standees and some people kind of bemoaned it and were like, oh, come on. It would be so much cooler the other way. So then they're like, fine, here's a Kickstarter. If you really want them, we'll do minis for every damn thing in the box. And that is Cephalofair with Gloomhaven. And again, to me, this is the perfect solution. This is the, you get the not so cheap retail version. And then if you really want to go all out, you can do it. And to me, that part of that is actually the um, response to crafters and 3D printing and Etsy stores and people who are making their own deluxe versions of the components and the company going, you know, why are we letting Joe print Gloomhaven minis when we can make our own and our fans will buy them? Well, I mean, and I, I guess suppose at the same point, it's why are they now killing home markets of, you know, people who are doing great work and making minis and deluxified stuff, you know, now slow is coming True. out there and stomping on all these people who well, found, as far as a, I know found a niche in the market and, you know, and, 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 took took advantage of it uh, or you know not even taking advantage but you know there was a hole in the market that yep. these people decided to fill but once Cellafair puts out their version even if they don't stop the other people from from taking yeah, I was part say, the Cellafair is not stomping no, on no, they're not, they're, they're not, no games workshop they're not stopping they're not physically stopping them but the fact that Cellafair is putting out a version is going to stop a large majority of yeah. people uh you know people are going to want the first party version rather than hunting around through Etsy to find the, the perfect third party version, even if there is a better version out there. So they right. are in fact, impa impacting the market, even if they're not, you know, sticking lawyers on anyone. Uh, I do, I do think though, that you're, you're right. That going back to Kickstarter for deluxified versions is actually almost right. the better way, you know, sell the basic version, get everyone, but prove that you've got a good game. First yeah. off, prove to me that you've got a great game 
and then say, all right, mini, mini people or deluxified people, coin collectors, whatever your deluxification is, we're going to Kickstarter. You know, a lot of people, once you have a game, get more of a direct connection to that company. Mm -hmm. So it's, you're yep. more likely to hear about it if you already have the game. And here, look, we're going to offer coins. We're going to offer minis. We're going to offer a, a box insert made specifically for this game, mm -hmm. whatever you offer. That to me sounds awesome. Um, that seems and, like uh, the, the perfect order of doing things. Prove the game, then deluxify. Yeah, which I, actually is what Fireside did, right? Like yeah. that's they they they, they improved. They had the game. People like the game. They improved on the game. They put a big box of the game, and then they offered a deluxe version. Now, I will I, I will want to add one caveat for anyone listening. We're saying Kickstarter like Kleenex here, um, crowdfunding, um, the P five hundred system from GMT, game any found. type of crowdfunding, um, itch funding. I'd like. Like Sean saying, yeah, launch a Kickstarter later. No, it can be whatever. It can be a pre-order system. Fund if you get 500 pre-orders. <laughs> yes. Heck, if Cellafair wants to open up an Etsy store to do it. <laughs> yeah, go for I it. I mean, you know, go for it. However you would like to do it. Actually, to be honest, a game company opening an Etsy store for deluxified versions of their components is actually a pretty smart idea. Um, yeah, though I haven't <laughs> seen any do it yet. But yeah, it makes sense. Well, Etsy takes a percent, right? They're better off selling it. Yeah. From what I understand, Etsy takes a pretty significant uh, yeah. cut yeah. out of what you sell. So if in most companies, you're going to probably just do it on your own website because your own fans know who you are. And that's who's shopping from you. Um, we kind of hinted at earlier, but the other thing I wanted to talk a bit about is the rise of standees. Now, there have been standees forever. I, um, our friend G, uh, Jerry, GM Jerry Mander, has been collecting standees instead of minis for years like like going back to 4e D D and possibly even 3.5 they just weren't as common now we're seeing them a lot now there are two types of standees of course there is the cardboard standee which is you get some kind of plastic base and you put a piece of cardboard on it um sometimes that cardboard is just a shape but usually it has artwork on it sometimes the same artwork some people do them a little better and it's two-sided um along with that are all the paper minis out there that's something you can find a ton of on drive through uh another friend of ours david oakham makes some of the best paper minis i've ever seen um but now what we're seeing more of and it's got to be due to some kind of manufacturing process that's been perfected or some drop in price are the acrylic minis the acrylic standees that are clear plastic where the artwork is actually between two layers so they don't get scratched up right like you might lose a little shine but the artwork can't get damaged or scratched and of course the main game we've talked about a lot is disney sorcerer's arena which of course has the fantastic disney acrylic standees but even whiz kids WizKids is like the miniature company. They're they're the people behind Hero Clicks. They did they did um Mage Knight. They're the company that has the license for both Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder. They're doing the new Critical Role minis. They also had the license with Renegade to do Wardlings. Like this is the company that is the Grenadier of 2023, right? Like this is the miniature company. They now do standees for both D and D and Pathfinder, and I think that's fantastic. And I have seen a growing number of Kickstarters that are now including standees in their games or just Kickstarters for standees. Like, get our um, non-licensed version of the D&D &D Monster Manual, one copy of each in standee format. Kind of like we were talking about um, Etsy shops doing pre-painted miniature, or not pre-painted, sorry, um, miniatures. There's a whole ton doing standees now. So there's a few aspects to this. So first off, while they are a great and more cost-effective option, you're still using plastic. Yeah. Pulling the protection off them, as you know all too well, is a <laughs> huge pain. And now, if you are the artistic type, you can't paint them even no. if you want to. So I suppose part of the question is, who is it you're appealing to? Um, there's, there's some questions there. So one other thing that actually just sort of arrived to me, and I didn't make any notes about this, is... So if you look at who's doing it, so right now Disney is doing it. Disney, yep. who is got, you know, fantastic, copyrightable, trademarked, artistic representations uh, already generally in 2D format. Uh, yeah, they I was going to say protect. the big thing with Disney is the fact you're getting a 2D representation of a 2D character, which is part of what I love and why I think it works so particularly well with that game. Absolutely. And I think, you know, to be honest, you were talking about uh, 
uh, Masters of the Universe being big chunky yep. figures. To me, Masters of the Universe was more of a cartoon. You had all the the toys, but for me, yeah. it was more the cartoon. And I think standees would have worked just as well, taking that you know cell animation from the show and and mm. making standees out of that. But what I realized is one of the issues we're running into is 3D printing becoming as popular and promoted as it is. Anyone can 3D print, can scan and reproduce 3D models. Yeah. And it's really hard to pr to police the copyright aspects in sure. the 3D maker world. Whereas it's very clear cut that an image of Scully from a Pixar animation is copyrighted. There's no question about that. And if you are reproducing that, you are infringing Disney's copyright and subject to any legal, yeah. whatever they would like to throw at you. So. I, yeah, I definitely agree. I don't know. The, you had asked uh, who do standees appeal to? And I've got to say, I think a standee in general looks way cooler than a cube or a meeple, um, especially the ones that are done like the acrylic see-through where all you really see is the character and they have some white space around them. I, I don't know exactly why that's always so wide on standees, something to do with the production process or how much gap has to be there or whatever. But I find they look better than, say, a cube or a token. Um, a great example of this is, is I'm just going to look at Dungeons & Dragons for a second. So Dungeons & Dragons, back when I was running 4E, I was doing... Um, I, I was doing actual play and they used to send the pre-painted miniatures to us. Well, to save money, they eventually stopped and they switched to cardboard tokens. I hated the tokens. I don't know what it was. I wanted that three third dimension of the battlefield. Now that said, I was also someone else who always used 3D scenery with my games. I didn't put walls because walls are bad. They block view, but I always used 3D scenery. I couldn't stand the tokens, even when they gave me tokens that were pictures of the monsters. Now, once they got to saying monster one, monster two, monster three, and that's what I was supposed to use to promote their game. I thought it was a little ridiculous, but that's a completely different story. <laughs> but to me, the standees that in between, it's the, I'm not paying the price for the miniatures, but more so, I'm not a miniature painter anymore. And I think a standy, full color, nice acrylic two-sided standy looks better than an unpainted miniature. I get a full color representation of my thing on the board. And I think that looks way cooler than a blob of gray or a cube of gray. No, fair enough. Uh, one thing I think you do have to make a choice on if you are going from cube to standy of any form, um, once you once you upgrade from cube to standee, it doesn't matter if you're using a paper standee, a plastic, an acrylic standee, or a mini. You yep. have got already decided to upgrade the size of things. So your yes. board size and and your scale for minis, for other minis or scenery or whatever. So just by making that one step from from cube or or meeple or whatever little wooden component to a standee of any size, mm -hmm. you've now upgrade had to you know, size up everything relatively. Yeah. In general, I've seen some attempts to not do that, which I'll call out one in a minute. Um, but first, cause I just because we're talking about cubes versus minis, the other thing you are getting is accessibility, a cube versus a standard meeple. You're not going to be able to tell apart what's in front of you. Whereas once you get into shaped standees or even more so a chunky piece of plastic that looks and feels like an orc, you're definitely improving the accessibility of your game. Um, yes and no, because at a certain point, um, you're almost getting too much detail. You know, like when you get up to a mini, you need too much detail. Whereas if you sized it down to a a, a meeple of, uh, I want to go back to the the recent one we just did from uh, uh, Valeria, um, Castlands of Valeria. You look yep. at all the detailed, slightly different uh, shapes on all of the different pieces that made it very mm -hmm. quick and easy to, yes. without your vision, tell what piece was what piece. And I think that is even more accessible than when you move up to, you know, a, a, a miniature, especially. I agree that, you know, shaped standees can certainly offer that same, same yep. uh, noticeability. Yeah, the other one, plus there's the advantage of, of flat things are flat, so you're not knocking anything over with your hands. But again, I, it, it, I would definitely shape shaped meeples beat out cubes or the generic carcass on the meeple, right? The, the generic shape. Shaped is better in, in all ways for differentiating parts at a glance, for appearance on the table, for accessibility. I think in all cases, please give me at least that minor step towards 
I, it doesn't have to go to miniatures, but give me that minor step towards, like I said, shaped, individually shaped. Give me resources where the food looks like an apple and the wood looks like a, a stick of wood and the, the stone looks like a cube. Going all the way to my knights are meeples holding swords and my swordsmen are meeple on, or my, my cavalry are meeple on horses, right? Uh, Ryan make, brings up a great topic in the chat and one that we haven't really ever discussed. Uh, a flat standee or flat objects allow for the placement of an NFC tag, which is something yeah. that a, 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 you know, an impaired meeple of some form uh, can use to, uh, you know, as a way of identifying things. If they've got their phone there, they can tap a, an NFC tagged uh, standee or whatever onto their phone. And it says, you know, the name of whatever it is uh, or, or put, or put Braille on it, uh, flat surfaces, uh, whether it's on the bottom or on this or one of the sides of the component do make for great accessibility features. Now that one though, I've seen on miniatures. So there are multiple games now, at least three I can think of off the top of my head that did M NFCs and their miniature bases. So I don't think that's relegated to flat. Braille probably, but again, you could probably put something on a miniatures base with Braille and it would be just as effective. My concern is if you're fumbling around, right? Like if your vision impaired enough, you have to feel around, miniatures are gonna get knocked over. Very fair. Although, I mean, you know, cubes are going to get skittered around and that could almost be worse. Well, than it, it's just a knocking a thing is what I'm thinking, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to describe it without, you know, if you're watching me, you can kind of see me feeling around. I, here's another example of it, though. Like, I, I and and this is the chat's already kind of gotten there ahead of us is me, minis aren't always an improvement. So we've already talked about the accessibility. We, I, I don't even think we need to talk about it, but obviously the cost, right? That That's a pretty straightforward one. Um, then there's a whole amount of plastic we're putting in the world, microplastics. I'm not going to get into that one. Um, but what I want to talk about is just functionality at the table. We mentioned Castellans, Castellans of Valeria. Um, maybe if you switch to the like little plastic minis or something might be okay. But like, then you got to make that board bigger to fit everything. Now, another example though, is when you try to make it all cooler, you're now having miniatures need to stand up and that's actually a problem. So the perfect example of this from my personal collection is 878 Vikings. Now this is a follow-up to the Birth of America series, which were cube pushers. They were cube pushing war games that used different color cubes that were very clear what they were. A red cube was this player's cube, a blue cube was that player's cube. They all represented the same units. And then you had some special characters that were represented different ways. Well, with Vikings, they did a Kickstarter. And at first it was cubes, just like every other game they've ever published. And then as a stretch goal, they started offering, like, you can get the miniature version, which I'm sure looks fantastic at cons. Actually, I've seen a game of Vikings set up at a con with full paint and stuff. It looks amazing. But one of the stretch goals changed it so everyone's game, excuse me, everyone's cubes were replaced by little tiny English soldiers and Vikings. And you also get some standees for the, the characters, um, the hero, uh, heroes is the wrong word. Historical figures is a better term, historic game. And these minis are horrible. I hate them because for one, they're, they're tiny and they don't stand up and you're moving like six from this spot where three go here and three go here. And then you're moving your army of 20 Vikings that just came off the boats down here and leaving one behind everywhere. That is so much easier to physically do with cubes. And then the minis just fall over. And I'm like, if they weren't minis, like if the cubes don't fall over, <laughs> right? Like I would just leave them. It looks fine. But minis laying down just like, I, I'm not even all that HD, ADHD or anything, but I hate leaving them. I want to stand them all up. And then I, I move my pile of guys and then I had to stand them all up. And I move my next pile of guys and I had to stand them all up. They're tiny. They're weighted poorly. And, and I hate them. Like I, I of all the, the games in that series, that's the one I'll play the least because of that, even though I think it's the one with the best mechanics. So yeah, when it comes to the 878, I, I really think that when they made the choice to put in a stretch cube to upgrade everybody to minis, uh, they realized that it was ridiculous and uh, unfeasible to upgrade everyone to real minis. And so yeah. they found a well, that, really cheap the... and, and you know a cheap solution. They saved money. They didn't go with a standard scale or base. And, and uh, instead of getting a, a cool bonus, the the average user paid the price with poor component quality as a result um hopefully i think most companies won't make a mistake like that and and you know try and push it onto people or if they are pushing it they're going to push it with the correct product and not a you know super cheap knockoff yeah. 
No, to be fair, like that's one example. I've seen others. Um, there was one I shared a deal on and I don't remember the name off the top of my head. And I had someone reach out and was like, what scale are these minis? And I'm like, yeah, they're six millimeters tall. And they're like, oh, heck, I can't use those for D&D. <laughs> and I'm like, here you have your Kickstarter. You're like, includes 1,200 miniatures. And you're expecting like these armies, but like they're super tiny. Like even Games Workshop did it, right? Like remember the Epic Scale stuff and the Mighty Empire stuff. And Mighty Empires in particular, those like skinny stands that showed like eight knights, I think I would have rather had like a wooden meeple or something. But it's Games Workshop, so of course it was a miniature. But but like I think that game would have been more functional with just like colored flags moving on the board instead of these like armies you were supposed to paint that were super tiny. Yeah, and I mean, well, let's look at the uh, you you've got a set of uh, mechs that you are you you haven't built yet. Yes. <laughs> Talk about small, uh, you know, ridiculously small scaled stuff. That, those Robotech minis are. Um, yeah, ridiculous. <laughs> but I, yes. again, that that does seem to be the outlier. I think a a majority of games, at least games coming from uh, well-respected manufacturers, are using a standard scale of some sort. Uh, and not and not cheaping out with little yeah. uh, little Chinese you know uh, weebles. <laughs> but to be fair, I don't think that changed my point. My point though is, in some cases, miniatures aren't better. Like it's just clearer to see, easier to move, especially easier to move. Like if you're playing a skirmish war game and you're moving one unit at a time, yeah, okay, minis are nice. Or if you're representing your hero on a battlefield, but when you're having to move packs of units and and groups of things around or you're trying to figure out area majorities you want it to be as clear as possible um rising sun falls into the problem of once you have painted them when you leave them unpainted they're great because they have nice color coded bases but like you make everything colored and you're like wait whose troops are those like yes they look distinct but not as distinct as a yellow cube versus a red cube would be that's fair i think for movement again we get into whether they were made right or not like if you've got you know uh, an army of GW minis, you know, the, the bases all fit together. You put a, a little plastic ruler behind them and slide them across the table and, and, you know, you move your unit. That's what they're designed to do. But again, when you've cheaped out and not gotten proper scale and proper, uh, proper bases and balance, and you're trying to move them around on a non, you know, non properly, uh, uh, square or hex battle map, then yes, you're absolutely going to get problems. But I don't blame that on the minis. I blame that on the game manufacturer buying the wrong product for the game. Um, you know, again, if it, the, 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 the minis were, could have been done, made better and made it easier and not have fallen down every time you tried to, to move them. Uh, the other thing I do like, though, are the games that do halfway, right? Um, meeples that are uniquely shaped. We already kind of talked about that. Usually still would. Um, less detail, less cost than a a um, miniature, but a, better than a generic chunk of wood. Even better are the like custom meeples. More and more games are coming with very awesome custom meeple. Um, one of the one that stuck out to me recently was um, I'm trying to complete blank on the name, the book game, the library game. Oh, what was it called? Where you had fantasy creatures in a library. This is what happens when we have open discussions and we don't script the whole show. So I look up the names of games, uh, whatever that one was called. That was Ex Libris. That's what it's called. Ex Libris had awesome little unique miniatures for each or not miniatures, meeple for each, each um, henchman and your main character. And none of that mattered. They, they could have been pawns like that, but it's thought they were awesome. Or the other thing, or is either silkscreen miniature or meeples, silkscreen meeples or stickers. Obviously, silkscreen's cooler. Uh, I get the price difference. I definitely prefer that. Um, I hate stickering things, to be fair. I absolutely hate stickering. Give me silkscreened over top. Um, I'll pay the 5 to $10 difference in MSRP because that's about probably all it takes on a production run to go to silkscreening. Even here, you get production the the same sort of production problems you run into with your eight seventy eight Vikings, where you know they don't think it out truly, and you get uh, single sided, so only half the board can see what that mini. You know, they, they put a silk screen on, but they only put it on one side. Yeah, or they have poor color choices because how many games have we called out that mm -hmm. you know if you if you have color uh, problems, you can't tell apart this this player piece from this player piece um or lack of enough distinction it's hey you've got these five different cubes that are all exactly the same size and shape they just are different colors 
well, that's going to be a problem for some people, even if the colors are correct, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's going to be problematic for somebody. Yeah, so, but that wouldn't even be, that's not even what I'm talking about here. That's the base level. I'm talking about halfway, right? They're shaped meeples. They're, they they look like knights and whatever. No, but again, they, they still do sometimes make, you know, okay, so they, they've upgraded, but they're all the same knight, even though they should be different, right. different colors or things. You know, they they need to take sometimes take those extra steps. And at that point, is it not, is, is it maybe easier to go up to an acrylic standee or a mini if they're putting all this money and, ec- and extra effort into customizing the meeples? Now, another thing I want to bring up is texture. I, in general, would rather touch a wooden piece like a meeple when playing a board game. I don't know why. Like if, I, if, if I'm touching miniatures, I want to be playing a miniature game. If I'm playing Warhammer, I want to be moving my units that look like my troops. But if all I'm worried about is who has the most armies in section three when we get to scoring, I'd rather touch and feel the wooden pieces. That's fair. And no, and I think there's going to be a wide range on this one. This one, I don't think we can really call either way. There were probably yeah. some people out there who would much rather touch and feel a mini. Uh, or other people who just think the nice smooth fact of an acrylic is nice because it, it feels great, but it also stacks nicer than a mini, uh, even yep. though it takes up a little bit more space than a cube. So, Well, the, the other big thing too, though, is when I touch a mini, I got to worry about breaking it. I'm not going to break a meeple. Very, very true. Well, there are a couple of meeples out there, I think, where... Well, they're, okay, they're, sure, they're, but, they're, but, but in general, general okay, part, even yeah, back, better, go back to cubes. I, I don't know. have to worry about the cubes, and if I lose one, who cares? Uh, you know, I didn't ruin hours of painting work that I've done or broken off a spear but because I grabbed something the wrong way. And uh, speaking of, of breaking off things on mini, storage and cleanup yep. uh, is, is sort of the next thing. That's I think, the other one. Uh, worth talking about. Uh, we have we have run into games where their own storage system damages the weapons yeah. that the minis are holding. Yeah, and then, then I hate the, the you give me the vacuum molded tray where each miniature only fits in a certain way. And yeah, pro tip, take a picture of that and then include that picture in your box. Then you can always figure it out. Um, but like droopy swords, bent spears. Uh, if you paint anything, you probably don't want to lay it down in a plastic tray and shake it around round as you move your board game around that'd be terrible at that point you now have to display your painted miniatures well you probably want to do but then you're going out to board game night now you're looking at buying reaper miniature case actually i think we have an entire episode on transporting miniatures <laughs> I, I i think we did that once so maybe check that out but like there is a, i think we did storing and i think we did storing and transporting your miniatures was an episode we did if, if my memory serves so you might want to check that out but like that's a whole nother level you have to worry about and that is honestly my biggest problem with the big miniature board games from Cool Mini and all that. You get all these boxes. What, are you going to bring them all to play? Or are you going to put them on your shelves? Like, you want to just take it all out, but then you have all these loose miniatures. Where do you put those? I Like, it, even Tori and Kat have complained because they went all in on Marvel United. They're like, what do we do with all this stuff? And the miniatures are fragile enough. You don't want to just toss them in a box, right? You're, you're like, you get the right game, like the Funkoverse games. The Funkoverse games come with miniatures. They're pre-painted. You don't have to paint them. I'm calling them miniatures, but they're mini Funkos. Those toss them all in a bin. Who cares? And then put in a Ziploc bag with all the weapons. But your average, like Cool Mini or not, Fantasy Flight, uh, Ninja Division, Steam Forge game, miniature game, you don't want to toss those miniatures anywhere. And then there's de- the Cthulhu Death May Die. Good luck tossing, tossing that miniature yeah. anywhere. <laughs> well, even that, like it came in its own box. It didn't even come in a game box. It was in a shipping container when you got it. Well, I mean, that's the thing with, you know, a lot of the, the Marvel stuff, especially, right? You know, you've seen pictures, you know, of two wheeled people with two wheeled carts wheeling around a stack of boxes as tall as they are for all the Marvel product that's come out. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, and then, you know, yeah, that's the, 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 the shipping container and and you can probably size it down some, but how much if you get into proper storage and, and, you know, shipping and, and, you know, not shipping, but just carrying out out to a game store or or over to someone else's house to play. Like Um, I didn't realize enough people who buy those kind of games probably already have a dedicated playing space because they're the gamers who are buying things like that and probably don't transport them a lot. You still have storage. Like I literally got rid of Rising Sun because the amount of room it took up on my shelf. I could fit 10 games instead of one. It took up more than one shelf in a bookshelf. It took two shelves and I have mine set pretty far apart. They're not nice, narrow, you know, novel width shelves. I can fit a, you know, a, a standard ticket drive box either way you know like calyx height and i'm like this is taking up 
two shelves in my game room that could be better taken up by other games. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely, it's a choice that you need to make. And it's a choice that I think that game companies need to think about allowing people to make, you know, we, you know, Simon is going to make miniature games, but other companies outside of, of specifically, you know, GW, Simon and miniature creating companies uh, really need to think about whether or not they they need to go that direction or how to best cover the market on both sides of yeah. the debate. And I think for for uh, they're going to keep coming. People are still backing them. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. I didn't do the research ahead of time to figure out what the latest one is. But I bet you if we went to Kickstarter right now, probably bring it up live, there is some huge miniature Kickstarter there that's 1,000 past its stretch goal or it's, it's, it's funding goal. They're still coming. They're still making them. So someone out there is buying them, even if it's not necessarily us. And I do wonder if it's the miniature collectors that are buying these. So that is another aspect of this is some people don't even care about the game. We have a friend, Dave Garby, who has backed multiple Kickstarters just to get the miniatures. I picked up a copy of, no, can't remember the name of it. And I can't even go see it on my game shelf because I know it's buried. Okay. I picked up a sci-fi miniature game that was some kind of version of Aliens to get the bases because it was so cheap. It didn't do very well. I could get the core game for 20 bucks and it came with 100 sci-fi bases that if I ever got back into Warhammer 40k, I could put all my Space Marines on way cheaper than buying bases from Games Workshop and way easier than building my own. I bought that game literally because of the bases in it. That's it. So even I've done it. Like I said, my friend Dave does it constantly, and he's he's always like, hey, you want some extra game boards, you want stuff? And I'm like, no, nah, I'm not. A, if, if I was a developer or designer, I'd probably grab all those extra bits off them and stuff. Or, like, technically, I could probably get the games off them and then replace all the components with meeples or cubes. Yeah, no, there's definitely an aspect of it. people, you know, the painters who are out there and love and who love the painting and love the displaying and love having these miniatures that they've, they've worked on or taken part in. Uh, some of them of course are obviously doing hack and slash and, and, you know, building, building their own minis from uh, yep. cobbling together from others or working with uh, existing minis and 3d printing. Uh, although it's interesting. I, I wonder if there really is, I mean, I suppose there must be, but it, it seems like that would be not enough of a market to keep, the uh it going quite yeah. as well but at the same time i look at gw i mean you know the, the gw fans yeah. are keeping it going and they're the they're the same sort of people really so i guess yeah it really it's, it's it really it is the same people it's 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 uh, actually many of the people backing the kickstarters are sick of games workshop and that's why they're backing kickstarters from what i've seen but that is that is not me so do we have any any Thing else i think i covered everything i thought we would talk about tonight but i'm open to talking about something else if there is any other aspect of miniatures and meeples you want to talk about but we are going to wrap up with what we prefer but before that anything else to discuss no i think that's uh it's pretty solid i think you know while i argued the other side realistically i prefer cubes and meeple on, uh, on my games that's that's what i'm willing to pay for uh, cause I'm certainly not going to paint, uh, <laughs> though for the right game, if you've got the right IP, like if you have cell art, you know, cell, cell cartoons, then mm -hmm. acrylic standees really are a fantastic solution for games that have that IP already. Whereas me, I think it, I hate to do it, but it's a, it depends. Um, if it's a big miniature heavy game, um, I drawing blanks on names unmatched. I don't think Unmatched would be the game it was with a couple meeple. I think that's you are taking two historic or famous characters and battling them or in, in different terrains. You want the miniature. You want that representation of your character to look as cool as possible. Um, the Eric Lang games, I'm on the fence. I don't know. I, I like the miniatures in Rising Sun. I'm never going to paint them. Uh, possibly if maybe an ink wash on to bring out some details. I absolutely adore the little turple, turtle castles. But all of that were to work fine with meeples, counters standees, anything other than miniatures. The cost of that was astronomical. Um, though even now, they're, it's, it's not as bad now when you look at some of the more current ones. So I don't know. I'm on the fence for that one. 
But the whole thing for me is most games, I care way more about the functionality than the aesthetic. And that's someone who does run public play events where sometimes I want that game that catches people's attention. But I didn't want the game to catch people's attention for a cool mechanic. I want I want a cube tower or I want it to be a dexterity game that looks cool and not, oh, my God, look how big that Cthulhu miniature is. Um, for a great example of this, I no longer own Rising Sun. I did not keep a copy of Rising Sun. I no longer own Cthulhu Met Death May Die. Like they just weren't my kind of games. Um, another one, Zombicide. I had it. I tried it. I've gotten rid of it. I did play the game. Those are all huge miniature heavy games. Yet I've still got copies of El Grande and Power Grid and a whole ton of games with wooden cubes. So I think overall, to me, the gameplay is more important. But in the right game, I like having a miniature, like a, a battle game, uh, something like Adrenaline. I want a miniature that represents my character. Um, Kaido Robot Battles had some awesome miniatures for your robot battles. Robo Rally, I don't want a counter. I want a little, whether it be metal or plastic, over the years they've changed. thing. I, I, if, I think if I'm playing one character, I think maybe that's it. Maybe if each player is playing an individual character, it'd be cooler to me to have that. But if we're going abstract and units and things on a map or resources give me whatever's most functional i guess we don't really have i mean i have a preference i generally prefer yeah. that uh because for honestly for for unmatched i think an acrylic standee could do just fine i i don't think yeah it needs to a be stand, i'd be happy with a standee that'd be fine but i want at least that for that type, that 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 game um Again, like you Star want, Wars you, Epic if you're playing a character a, a character having right. it represented has uh has value whereas if you're playing a a a, a wash of you know unwashed masses or or my you know faceless armies cubes do the same thing <laughs> really yeah it's it's really, that you yeah. you want that character represented uh i think that's it yeah i think that's that's what i hadn't gotten to yet it's it's if i'm playing if if there's me if i'm on the board like if you know, if I'm on the board some way, if, if my representation in the game is present, I want that to look as cool as possible. All right. So really, um, it, it is what it is. Uh, some people like them, some people don't. As for us, I think they have their place. Sean prefers the the simplicity, the the less detail. Um, my biggest complaint about the miniatures, though, is is the the not trying to damage them, store them. That that is the part that I I find the most frustrating, and why I tend to avoid them is the amount of space they take and having to have a spot to have them on display, whatever. Um, that that is my biggest disadvantage. Well, I would love to paint them. That's never going to happen. Uh, one thing I will say I do love about miniatures and board games is there is no Games Workshop telling me I can't use it unless it's painted. Um, I am perfectly fine with my things being represented by a colored base on the bottom or different colored pieces of plastic to tell the sides apart. But to me, it's all about the functionality. Uh, I want the mo I want the game to be more important than the minis. That, that, that's it. I'm a game player. I am not a miniature collector. I'm not a miniature player. I want the game to be as functional as possible. But if I'm playing a character, make me look cool. I, I, I think that's probably the end, end answer. All right. So that was our discussion on whether meeples or miniatures are the best for gaming. Now, we're going to have a list of game suggestions to give you. But for that, you're going to have to tune in next week on episode 223. Thank you. If you want to hear more from the Tabletop Bellhop, always drop by our Discord at discord.tabletopbellhop.com. You can find us all over social media. It's Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And you can always send your questions or suggestions and comments to mo at tabletopbellhop.com. All right. So here we're going to check in with our chat room and see what miniature heavy games they recommend. First off is uh, Ryan with, if it's gridded or point to point movement, I prefer minis, but if it's section to section movement or place marking, meeples or standees are fine. Yeah, that, that that's kind of what I was thinking about the like, I'd rather move a, chunk, a handful of cubes to another area. But if I'm doing a dungeon crawl, there's another example we didn't even talk about earlier is dungeon crawls. Dungeon crawls, I'd love to see, like, here's my party. Again, it's I'm playing a character. I, here's my group of four adventurers, and here's the nasty monsters we're facing. Well, I think we summed, we summed that up pretty well with that with that character thing. When we started bringing yeah. up the difference between, between character and, and faceless mobs. Uh, Eggman Jr., Zombicide games have a ton of minis. Black Plague yep. and Green Horde are fantasy-oriented. I will yeah, correct his spelling as I read. 
<laughs> that's fine. We uh, we that one is 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 on our list. We did cover that one. Zombicide, I think, is a great example. And what they keep doing too is lots of little adv- expansion packs for very interesting things. Like you can now get an Iron Maiden pack for Zombicide, and so you got Green Horde, and you've got um uh, 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 me and me with game names tonight. Green Horde and the other Black Plague. You've got those two, but then there's also expansions for those, and then there are expansions that work for fantasy pretty well. So I think that's a great one. Uh, Descent Second Edition, if you can still find it, from Ryan. Yeah, is there a reason not the newest Descent? I I have to ask that one because I only own Second, First, and Second Edition. And to be fair, you get more miniatures in the First Edition, but I think the First Edition is now collectible. Right. Um. But Descent came with a ton of miniatures that were really, really nice, but very board game quality. Like the miniature gamers hated it because they just weren't nice enough and they had the bendy sword problem. They're kind of flimsy, but the board gamers are like, this is so much cooler than a counter. Uh, Eggman Jr. says Alter Quest had a ton, but I doesn't, doesn't know how available it is now. Yeah. So Alter Quest is basically someone trying to re-release Hero Quest before Hero Quest was re-released and it looks fantastic. So the one thing I'm noticing is what's going to happen is our entire list is going to get mentioned here <laughs> <laughs> by people. So uh-huh. That, that had, could be interesting, too. Uh, we had Math Guy Dave mention Aberration, which was uh, from Ghostfire Gaming on uh, GameFound. Okay, that one I don't know. That one I don't uh, know. That, just came, cool. that was just a September, possibly still live on GameFound. HeroQuest features a lot of minis. Yep, uh, HeroQuest is a great one. Any yeah. copy. If you can find the old one, you get a great bunch of um, Games Workshop inspired miniatures, whereas the new one, what they did due to stretch goals on Hasbro Pulse is offer you more and more sculpts. So now not every orc looks like every other work, which is pretty awesome. Uh, Darkling Blade says moving around a uh, having moving around a map, having a physical mini of your character helps highlight your place and such, but it gets tedious if there's a mini for every enemy, unless combat is very position oriented. Yes. If you're doing line of sight, Minis kind of get important at that yeah. point. But again, standees work fine for that. Look at Gloomhaven. Do you need a mini for every slime that's out there? A Massive Darkness 2 is another good one. Massive uh, Darkness look good. Massive Darkness is, is to me, falls in with Zombicide. It's the same company, uses some of the same mechanics. To me, it's like the evolution of Zombicide. But then they made Zombicide 2, so I don't know where it falls. Maybe Massive Darkness 2 is based on Zombicide 2. Eggman mentions Arena of the Contest Tenare's Adventures. That one, I don't know. That I'd have to look up. So that's exactly what I wanted. I want the chat bringing out these ones that, that I've never heard of. Because I said, I got rid of most of my miniature heavy games. Uh, if you like Cuphead, Town Folk Tussle has some awesome minis in that style. Okay. Uh, I don't know if that fits our style. fantasy uh, expectations. But uh, uh, Ryan's See, if we, saying if we move most away of the games from fantasy, one of the most impressive out there would be Mechs versus Minions. That game has some of the most amazing miniatures, but again, you're playing a character. Now, what they did is because the characters are so cool, they give you a million mooks that all look the same. Uh, Ryan's saying that most of the games he can think of that were chock full of minis are now out of print. Well, that's the other thing, right? A lot of these are Kickstarter only. Or if they went to retail, they didn't stay. They did like one big print run. They, I, I don't want to say cash their check because it ends up cool. Mini really doesn't make a lot of money on these games. Despite them making millions of dollars, those are millions of dollars that go to making games, right? Like a lot of people seem to think that once a Kickstarter makes a million bucks, it's a million bucks in their pocket. And I'm like, no, you still got to deliver and make the game. And that costs a lot of money, especially if you're making miniatures and you got to design the molds and you got to pay the sculptors and just because a Kickstarter makes $70 million doesn't mean the company made a penny. They might have even lost money. Yeah, at, the, at a certain point, they start losing money again, basically, when it gets up too high. And they didn't yeah. allow for the the, the sheer volume of uh, production. Uh, Ryan mentioned IDW was one that, you know, came and went. <laughs> the IDW yeah, they, TMNT they, I own and, um, the TMNT game from them. Yeah. And the Ghostbusters game from them, which were solid games. But again, the highlights of those, but that was a nostalgia poll more than anything. It was like, oh, check it out. Miniatures of your favorite characters was really the poll of those games. Though actually the Team NT one, I actually really enjoyed. D was mentioning that there was that one really over the top campaign where you modified the mini as you play. Uh, oh, that, none of that's us can remember coming. the name of it. That's the one from um, the people who did Zaya, isn't it? Where you have the swappable heads and everything. Oh, is that, was that who it was? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I remember that now. Yeah. I, I'm drawing a blank on the name off the top of my head, but it was, it was the lady. That one looked fantastic. It's like um, Darkling Blake okay. recalls Rising Sun felt like minis didn't seem necessary. Yeah. It's, I like, they look awesome, but 
And to be fair, you got enough of them in one area and they didn't fit, which is why they had to put out a bigger board. So it definitely had that problem that Sean called out of once you had minis, you need more room to put them. Uh, Cthulhu Death Might Die, that was terrible in that game. We had, we had miniatures sticking all over the place. <laughs> uh, people were asking, you said you got rid of your Rising Sun, but it's behind you on the shelf. Uh, that'll be in an extra life auction at some point. All that right. is not mine. Iridia, the paths we dare tread is the one with the customizable minis that okay. change. Uh, Eggman Jr. mentions Vagrant Strong has awesome acrylic standees. Not one I know. Again, that's exactly what I'm looking for. So thank you for that one. Ryan was asking if there were Kingdom Heart minis. Uh, the there was talisman? a Kingdom Hearts talisman. Yeah. I don't know if it came with minis. Here, there's an example of a game. Talisman. When I played it, it was standees, like paper standees, eventually replaced by cardboard, then eventually switched to miniatures. Again, I like the minis, but again, I'm playing a single character, right? It's it's the personification. Uh, Eggman Jr. is responding to, uh, to oh, a, a vagrant a, song. A comment I made in passing. Uh, weebles would be better because they wobble, but they don't fall down. That's true. Uh, so we, we need a game. We need uh, some manufacturer out there to get a license for meeple for we, uh, weebles and start uh, putting those. We'll out call them as... weeples. Weeple we'll weebles. Weeples. Weebles. Weebles. And yes, Kingdom Hearts Talisman comes with. Kingdom Hearts, Disney, Fantasy Flight, Fantasy Flight, uh, Final Fantasy style characters. Uh, Everdell missed a trick by not doing silk screened meeples. I mean, they did so many other deluxifications. It's strange they never did it. Now, here's an example of Elf Creek Games. They are one of those that are like, they did this uh, kind of what Sean recommended. Like, here's our game. But you know what? The coach things, if you want them silk screen, you can buy that. These tokens, if you want them in metal, you can buy them. These lanterns, if you want them like see-through, glow-in-the-dark, you can buy them. And it's all little tiny packs you can buy separately, where on the Kickstarter you could get it all in. But they definitely tried that whole, um, you can buy lots of little bits to improve on your game. So it sounds like, based on our chat, that may not be working for them. Complete Collection has too many stickers, says Ryan. I'm not sure which game that was referring to. Yeah, um, I don't know the collection of what for stickers. Uh, Minis uh, ramp up quickly to being a hobby lifestyle. Very true. Yes. Very true. But that's why I wanted to stay away from miniature games. Most of the ones that, that, that we call out are, are games where painting to me is totally optional. I don't see a lot of board gamers painting their miniatures. Like there are some, but in general, I, I, most people like sharing pictures on Instagram even, they're unpainted. Uh, Ryan's pointing out game found does in fact seem to have, uh, the IP based mini heavy games these days. That is yeah. definitely where, where things have gone for whatever reasons. Dave clicked on Kickstarter and looked at the top games. Didn't see a big mini game, but there was one with the cutest meeples, wondrous <laughs> creatures, uh, sword and sorcery also for mini miniatures from Eggman Jr. Yeah. That one's supposed to be good. Very much any of the dungeon crawling games, right. will come with some type of awesome minis to, to to make them stick out uh steve's pointing out that my little scythe has an okay amount of great minis really okay uh, see scythe got apparently called he out. painted the full set of it so <laughs> uh blood rage is also great with minis yeah all the eric lang games the the eric lang trilogy of area control board games i think are a great example uh so that aberration game uh from dave was because uh, it was from ghostfire games who makes a lot of D D stuff Ah, okay, so D and D mini heavy. I, I didn't even call them out, but the D and D miniature games used to be fantastic for paint, paint for for miniatures. I used to be able to get pre painted ones, and then they switched to unpainted ones. Now they're down to tokens. So there's an example of a company moving away from it, and a company that's like almost miniature based, right? Yeah. So like the D and D adventure games went from pre paints to unpainted to tokens. Uh, Massive Darkness is more of a dungeon crawler, while Zombie Side is more skirmish. But it's uh, to me, they're still very similar games. Uh, the Tenaris game we mentioned earlier has a ton of minis, apparently. Yeah, I'm looking at Tenaris, and it does that's a lot of minis. <laughs>